Welcome to Business Conversations with your host, business strategist, Clive Ennevar. Clive is joined by expert guests as they talk business behind the scenes to give you the tools and insights to support your growth, security, and serenity as you strive for your success. Welcome to another episode of Business Conversations with Clive Ennevar. I am Clive Ennevar, business strategist, and we're having a conversation with Dr. Kaz about how to disaster-proof your business. Dr. Kaz is an award-winning international speaker, executive coach, author, and brain trainer. She has worked with Fortune 100 companies, international associations, three Olympic teams, and 34 Olympians from US, Australia, and Pacific Rim. She's known throughout the world as the Get A Done Gal. Hello, Dr. Kaz, and welcome. Hello. Thank you so much, Clive. Glad to be here. Absolute pleasure to have you because working with all of those teams and as our title suggests, suggests how to disaster-proof your business, that suggests that you've learned a few tricks along the way. That I have. I, I have been blessed meeting some of the best minds in the world. And what, what I find very interesting, I grew up with a mom who was the first businesswoman in the state of New York to get a business loan without her husband's signature. So I learned early on, she owned a flower shop. And I learned early on when disaster hits, you have to have a backup plan. And I've ever since I was eight or nine years old, I've approached everything I've ever done with a disaster plan. And when I went into sports, uh, I was, I went very quickly when I was brain training athletes. So I went from being unknown in, and this was in Australia to within 90 days of coaching two of the three, asking to coach two of the three Olympic teams at that time and working with three professional teams, a baseball team, the Brisbane Bandits, um, a rugby league team, uh, the Camry Crows, and then a um, Aussie Rules team. So they would laugh at me, but we would start out with, what's the worst possible thing that could happen? And, and they had to start small and build on that. Um, and I wish I could tell you the concept of a disaster party was mine, but it was brought to me um, by a great friend in when I was young. Oh my gosh, early twenties, like 24, 25, I started speaking in the fitness circuit. And there were a lot, everybody was old. They all could have been my dad, except for like three of them. They were all older than me. But there was one young guy who was about 30 years old and he ran the largest and the most expensive tennis club in the United States. And he did it predominantly with youth, kids under 20 years of age, making, oh, back then, maybe $5 an hour. And we could not figure out how he had the most expensive and the highest um, membership, both in expectations, the level of commitment by cash, and, and the level of service. And I used to say to him, how do you get a 15-year-old kid to give six-star customer service to your clientele? And he'd say, it's easy. I teach them, you know, how to think. I teach them how to make decisions. I was like, okay, I'm in. And he described what he did. And it so amazed me. Every six months, I'd say, got any disasters you did? And he'd go, yeah. And one time, he described the most 
unheard of situation. The, co the club was in North Carolina, which is similar to around Sydney, if we're looking at location wise. And tornadoes, and they never get tornadoes, rarely in North Carolina. Tornadoes were predicted Friday night, three levels, bottom level were the kids having a teen party, middle level were senior citizens, bingo, top level, the dance. And about eight o'clock, the alarms went off. And he said, my staff and I had 15 minutes to get everybody into the basement. And he said, about four hours, we just heard bedlam going above us, above us. All hell broke loose. They came out around midnight, cars turned over, trees down, everything in the clubhouse blown out glass wise. No water, no electricity. Back then, no Lyft, no Uber, you know, taxis in this town. So by 2 a.m., those whose cars weren't damaged and the taxis that came out got everybody home. And he sat on the steps with his staff and he said, they said, are we going to be able to open tomorrow? He said, I don't know. He said, it's, it's bad. He said, but now tomorrow morning, I have to call three brides and tell them they can't get married here tomorrow. And so the kids are like, no, we can disaster this. And he said, guys, we, we can't. And these 16 to 20 year olds in one hour figured out a disaster plan. And the only thing he had to do was call the three brides and say, may we push you back three hours? And they all went, what? Didn't the club get hit? He said, yes, it did but you will have the most magical wedding. And these kids pulled together three weddings in less than, say, 90 minutes of planning and then executed everything. And when he told me that, I realized when you're in business, you have to be able, you know, people say a plan B. No, you have to be able to have a disaster plan. You have to know what to do I've been doing disaster plans for 33 years. We've, I have never disastered a pandemic, um, but there are many of my clients in March pulled together their staff and did just that. So with these disaster plans, the key you mentioned early on is that we need to be able to make a decision and to make a decision, we need to be able to know how to think. And we, in knowing how to think, we need to know what to think about. Is there a really simple thing for those people who might be a little bit concerned that if I create a disaster plan, I'm courting a disaster <laughs> so that they can understand how one thinks or what one thinks about in order to make the right decisions to have the result come to you as, as quickly as you just outlined? So there are three steps to the disaster party. It's great for all generations and genders. I've done it with, you know, we've disastered proms here in high school, 16, 17 year olds. I've disastered a funeral. That was kind of interesting. But we have taken just companies in general and the way it starts out, it's all about, th some people naturally think well, and some people naturally make decisions well. About 27% of the population do both of those things quite well. The rest of the people have to learn. It's like some people play the piano well, they're virtuosos, the rest of us have to take piano lessons. So I realized early on, people love to party, they love games, they love doodling, so we, I put together a three-step process that allows the brain to get better and better and better at thinking with each step in the process. So this part one starts out, let's, um, let's do an anniversary party for a company. They wanna, they're, it's their 20th anniversary and they're gonna throw a really big shindig. I mean, this is, the party of all parties, wherever you are 
around the world, but everybody in town is going to know this is an amazing event. So people sit around a round table, an oblong table, usually 12 to 15 people, mostly the executive directors in hotels, department heads. And you, the person who's facilitating, you start on the left and you explain, okay, we're going to disaster our 20th anniversary event. And you're all playing against each other in part one. So you can win prizes, you can like candy, toys. And on the table, I put down finger paint paper and everybody can doodle. There's crayons, there's finger paint, there's magnetic clay, because we know from kindergarten, if your hands are moving, so is your brain. So when you're playing, you begin to stimulate what I call the dose, D-O-S-E, dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, and endorphins. Those are happy hormones, but what they don't realize in many companies is those are the same chemicals that create massive thinking, decision-making, money-making ideas. So in part one, we get the dose going. And I say, what's the littlest thing that could go wrong in hosting this 20th anniversary event? Typo on the invitations. And so as they go around, they have to get a little bit worse each time. So if you go around three times, by the time you, I call them mini, medium, and mega disasters, by the time you get to the mega you have CEOs dying, you have planes crashing in the building, and they're laughing. And here's the deal. No zombie apocalypse. Like, it has to be believable. Yes, planes have crashed in buildings. Yes, CEOs have died at parties. So, but they, they love outdoing each other. And so it's like, oh, this catches fire and then all the computers are destroyed. And so at the end of part one, the dose is at the highest value. You go into part two, now I give them sense of urgency and I give them prizes. So I break them up into three parties of three. They don't get to choose their partners. I, you know, we randomly choose them. I have them pick names out of a hat. And so the three cougars are on one side, three black bears, three golden retrievers, and each group, if there's five groups, 15 people, each group gets one-fifth of the mini, one-fifth of the medium, and one-fifth of the mega disasters. And I tell them they have 17 minutes and 37 seconds. They have to come up to qualify for the prize. Three workable solutions right now, three workable solutions for each of the disasters. And then I just say, go. And they start putting down solutions to these challenges or disasters furiously. Now, whoever has the most, that group of three will win a prize worth about a hundred dollars each. Dinner for two, limo, Air, air balloon, hot air balloon ride, fun things, things they might not do for themselves. And so I cheat a little bit if everybody's got ideas, because these are money making and money saving ideas for the company. If everybody's going to town, I give them a couple more minutes. Then I say, count them up, come back to the table. Part three is where they get to brag, bragging rights. They pick their most favorite disaster and their most favorite solutions. And then they get to brag in front of everybody. Now, what's interesting is I teach the company how to put together a disaster party diary. So I did a ton of these during Y2K. For those that are old enough and remembered when the world was going to shut down when we turned 2000, you know, everything, ATMs are going to be spitting out money and what, uh, Lights were not going to work. Traffic lights were not going to work. But what was interesting was January 1 came around. Everything worked perfectly. They went back and would hold kind of lunch and learn seminars 
How do we, you know, how do we implement this? Who's responsible for this? The best anyone's ever done with a disaster party was actually a Ford dealership on the Gold Coast. We did this with, I did like six disaster parties. Their staff came in and they would do each group would do a disaster party. And one of the mechanics came up with an idea that saved that company $250,000 in 12 months. But more importantly, it took the morale of the mechanics and put it through the roof. The loyalty he had from his staff was unbelievable. So yeah, you, you get to play, but it, with that sense of urgency and the prize on the table, people forget because they'll say to me, I'm not, I'm not good at thinking. I'm not good at decision making. I'm not good. But when you're in a game, you know, when you're a kid, you're in a game of dodgeball. It's like catch the ball or get out of the way, you know, because you don't want to have a big red spot on your face. And, and so we take the focus off of decision making and thinking and the tough stuff. And now it's on, ooh, we get to play for 17 minutes, you know, and, and your buddy speaks and says something and you're like, I can outdo him. I could win a toy. I can impress this facilitator. And so the thinking goes elsewhere, which is exactly what I do with elite athletes. It's, I want it, I want their thought process to be very simple. If you're a golfer, where do you want to put the ball and put the ball in the hole? That's it. That's all we're going to think about. Where do you want to put the ball on the green, on the, on the fairway? Okay. I take this club. I'm going to put it here. Where would you like to put it on the green? Where would you like to put it in the hole? And so because it allows them to play um, finger paint, the creativity goes through the roof. And I have 70 year old maintenance guys in city, uh, city employees that will tell you this is more fun than I've had, you know, in 40 years being on the job. But more importantly, you can do that same process in seven minutes. And that's what I want your listeners to understand. Seven minutes, take one challenge and go crazy. What about this? What about this? What about this? And out little prizes, little mini candy bars, you know, poker chips. Whoever has the most poker chips at the end gets, you know, dinner for two. Um, you start doing that. And that's like doing the scales to learn how to play the piano. Once the brain understands the mechanics of decision-making, it becomes a habit. You cannot not make a decision. And that's a, an extremely simple way of looking at things. That, uh, I, I love the fun of it. But uh, essentially what we've got to do is uh, give ourselves a good, a good dose of hormones add a sense of urgency and realize we can brag about our result. And thereafter, everything is just going to fall into place for us. But I really like the way you, you, uh, you talk about how thinking creates thinking. Um, it's one of the things that I talk about a lot with my clients who research things. And as you find a, a potential obstacle, don't see the obstacle, see what's beyond it. So, with your work with um, athletes, I imagine there's quite a bit of that. Uh, athletes might be people who, being high performers, they think that there's a limit to what they can do. Do you? How do you deal with that? It is interesting because I, I deal in two worlds. I deal mainly um, with executives and executive teams, high-level performers, highest in the company, and I deal with either athletes that would like to be elite athletes or athletes who are elite athletes and want to be better. Um, I think one of the things I learned early on, um, I was a very precocious child. I believed I could do anything, anywhere, anytime, um, which led me to total seven vehicles in my lifetime. And that usually 
gets a real <gasps> from people. And I always say, don't be so judgmental. I was only driving for the cars. Um, but one of the things I realized at a very early age was your mind will always put on blinders or limits if there's some sort of fear. So if there is no fear, then the mind is limitless. And when I work with the athletes, I tell them, you know, I, I have this, it's called the H cubed rule. Chiropractors love it. Keep your head, your heart, and your high knee, which is your bum, um, in alignment. So what you think and believe, the results come from the head. From the heart is what you feel. And that's where trust comes in. And your hiney or your bum, that's what you take action on. So if I can correct the thoughts, I'm not tall enough. I don't hit the bar far, far enough. I don't run fast enough. I'm not as good, you know, whatever the negativity is. That's pretty easy to clear up. It's the heart issues, the trust. I don't know if I trust myself to choose the right club. I don't know if I trust myself to get over 16 feet, like 5.3 meters in a pole vault. So when I look at it, it's not one or the other. It's, it's a, as in business, it's everything. So when I used to decide if I wanted to work with a company in Australia, because I lived there for 10 years, I would ask three questions. On a scale of one to four, how much do you guys laugh a day? Four being amazing all the time, so much fun to be here. One being, what? Are you kidding me? And so I knew if the company had an energy to grow and change and prosper, it started with the head, the heart, and the high knee. And so I asked the head question on results. Usually that was very easy to answer. I would ask a heart question, which was usually around trust or laughter. And then I would ask something on action taking. And what I've learned through the years is, and you know, this is, oh gosh, now I'm telling my age. This is like 41 years ago. I was teaching agricultural mechanics, how to tune your car, weld, hydraulic motors, masonry, how to castrate pigs. And I remember these kids once said to me, Miss, never let your mouth write a check that your butt can't cash. And they used a little bit of a different word there, but I realized, you know, uh, and I can't remember, it was, it was a famous football or a famous baseballer. It wasn't Babe Ruth, but they said, it ain't bragging if you've done it. It might've been Hank Aaron. And so I, the kids used to say, if we do it, we can brag on it. But if we didn't do it, we don't have the right to brag on it. So one of the things I found when I was coaching athletes in Australia, is they had a difficult time owning their success. And one of the things I found in coaching executive teams, they have a difficult time. They can brag about it, but they don't necessarily want to own it. Because I, I think what happens is we say, well, if I do X, if I shoot a 62 in golf, they'll always expect that of me. And in reality, we're, it's a fear of winning. So when we can eliminate that fear, then winning just becomes a part of business. It becomes a part of the sporting industry. Um, and there's nothing worse than the press. So I deal a lot with professional athletes when they're doing really well and no press. And then they mess up and it's everywhere. I mean, 30 years ago, we didn't have Facebook and Twitter and TikTok and all these different things, you know, it would appear in the newspaper and that was it. Now it appears on YouTube over and over and over again. And, you know, it gets shared by hundreds of millions of people. So how you deal with an elite athlete or how you deal as an elite business person 
at the core issue is trust. You know, Seth Godin said it well, know, like, and trust. And if you don't trust yourself, your clients won't trust yourself. I like that. And uh, perhaps we should expand on that a little bit more that know, like, and trust. Every person who's ever walked into anything to do with sales or walked into a business and been introduced to, here's a customer that you have to have no like and trust you or however it's come about. Very, very rarely I hear people say what you just said, which is it's all about you. No like and trust you before you can invite someone else to know like and trust you. It's so true, Clive. I mean, when I was working in sales and teaching sales, you know, back in the 80s, you would hear that statistic, three of the people will always buy. Seven of, or yeah, um, four of the people will straddle the fence. Maybe, maybe not. And three of the people will never buy. So seven if you got over 70% in sales, that meant you were convincing somebody who said no. I am not buying to buy. And I used to study, like, how, I did a lot of work in fitness centers. Like, how did some of these 18, 20, 22 year old kids sell $10,000, $15,000 a month in memberships and others couldn't sell three? What I discovered was, they, they didn't think selling was a bad profession. They loved it. It was a game. They enjoyed offering the services they had, offering the facility, the, the fitness center. They loved fitness. Um, but at the end of the day, they did know, like, and trust themselves. They knew the information. They would study the client. They would say, well, I understand you're 60 years old. The weight room might not be what you would love, but you could do a circuit training because we have circuit training for seniors and they love it at eight o'clock in the morning. And they knew exactly how to position the product for the buyer to say, I would like that. But I remember my dad owned the only liquor store in town. My mom owned the only flower shop tiny town. And my mom outsold my dad three to one. Now go figure. Grog or flowers? And she outsold him three to one. And I remember one day as I got older thinking, how the heck did she do that? Because she was, she had so much fun. That woman had more dose than anybody I know. She took up golf, was the first woman to get a membership at our country club in upstate New York. She and a friend would go on Friday afternoon. They never kept score. It would be over 200. They were, people, men just would line up to watch them play horribly. And my mom and her friend would laugh. Clive, my mom put her order book in her golf bag and would walk away with 50 plus orders by five o'clock on Friday for Saturday, she would bank thousands of dollars off these men. And I realized she knows opportunity. They all liked, they knew my mom, they trusted her, but they knew, you know, at the end of the day, they never felt like they were sold she always took time you know one one of the doctors would say chris did you get pete's wife um anthuriums from hawaii and she'd say i did but i can get your wife tulips from holland and i mean this woman had more fun but she knew her business she loved what she did and herself and she trusted that she was doing the best she could for him. And Clive, that's where I think, you know, I know you've seen brilliant salespeople. I believe it goes back to those three factors. 
every time it does, Dr. Kez. You're absolutely right. And, and I, I love your mum a lot. <laughs> I think that's absolutely delightful that uh, she was pre- prepared to go out there and have fun not playing golf in order to make extra sales and particularly picking a Friday night when the boys have got to go home after a couple of beers. <laughs> oh my God. The 19th hole was her spot. She would walk in there and literally, you know, probably get 40 of the 50 orders. She was a brilliant businesswoman. Be <laughs> extremely brilliant. Good on her. As I say, I like her a lot. And, and I can see that there's quite a bit of it has rubbed off on you. <laughs> and what I liked most about uh, your uh, description of how to have a disaster party and the the fun and games that it creates is it actually delivers a very, very serious result or a result which provides for serious outcomes and dealing with issues without the pain and angst and what have you. And at the end of the day, it's building habits. Your mum had a habit of going down to the golf club on a Friday afternoon and boosting the sales. And then, of course, being able to go home and brag to husband about it. I like that too. <laughs> yeah, mum was actually, mum was quite cheeky. <laughs> I learned how to sell. I can't see, I was, I can't see that I, anywhere in you, Dr. Kaz. <laughs> I was doing telephone orders at age four. So I would call up all over the world, FTD, floor, Telefloor orders, and I'd, I'd always get the same thing. How old are you? You'd, you sound kind of young. And I would say, age is immaterial. This is a four-year-old. Age is immaterial. Do you want this order or not? And that was all my mom's teaching. You know, yeah. I learned, she'd say, go sell Easter lilies. I'll give you a nickel and Easter lily. I would rock up, I'll take two. And I'd say, two? I know your porch. I know your wife. Are you sure you only want two? Okay, I'll take 10. Okay, thanks. And my thought was, oh, I just made 50 cents. So, you know, it was opportunity. The next year, I said, I want two salespeople under me. And I want, you know, a penny for each one they sell. Okay. So I went to my girlfriends and said, you have to wear hot pants, you know, pink hot pants. You have to wear like, you know, tight shirt. I I was like Hooters before Hooters originated. And and so I made money on them. Um, and, And I learned it all from my mom. At the end of the day, it was fun. Um, and when they left, I knew they got a great product. I knew their wives were not going to be unhappy. That's absolutely great. And we could talk all day, Dr. Kaz, and I know we haven't even scratched the surface of what you can tell us about uh, you know, building better habits and creating better business and so on. But time is against us. <laughs> but before I let you go, what is the best tip you have received from a business conversation? Actually, it goes back to my mom. And, and this is how I grew up, which explains a lot of how I approach life. From the time I can remember, she would ask two questions. And there's power in great questions. Um, as a matter of fact, she used to say to me, mouse bait, ask a great question and you'll get a great answer. So her first question was, mouse bait, are you okay? Which meant mentally and physically, And I had to answer, you know, nothing broken. I'm okay. A little embarrassed. And then the second thing, and this is what shaped my entire life. Mouse bait, what did you learn? So I grew up without shame or blame or condemnation. You shouldn't have done that. That was stupid. You're too young. I grew up with what did you learn? I'm laying in a hospital. I've just totaled four vehicles. I am in a state prison hospital. It was the closest place they could take me. It was the highest security prison in Florida. I got there three years before Ted Bundy, who in America was a mass murderer, like murdered like 25, 30 women. 
She shows up the next morning and I'm begging her, please get me out of here. You know, this is a man's prison. She walked in, first thing she said to me, Mouse Fade, are you okay? I said, I kind of messed up, broke a neck, 64 stitches in my head, broke a leg, hurt from head to toe, paralyzed from my neck down, but I knew they had assured me it was just temporary. You don't hit a state dump truck 60 miles an hour or which would be 100K head on and not be sore. Second question she asked, what did you learn? I got sassy. Don't fall asleep at the wheel. She said, no, dig deeper. So after about 30 seconds, I said, seriously, get the ambulance, get me in the ambulance, get me out of here. And she said, no, seriously, what did you learn? So I thought for a moment, and this began to shape my life. I said, you can have everything. You just can't have it all at once. She said, that's the lesson. A very good lesson to learn. And uh, if the more of us who learn that early, I think we'll uh, hold us in good stead for moving forward. But what is the top piece of advice you'd like to leave listeners with today, Dr. Kaz? It comes from a quote that I share with all my athletes. And I believe as a business person, as, a, as, a, as someone who has impact on others, and the quote is, you are either an influencer or being influenced. The choice is always yours. Very good point. For all of those listeners out there, I'll I'll give you an address in a minute where you can go and find a little bit more about that because I checked it out earlier and it's very, very good. But most importantly, before we let you go, Dr. Kaz, how can our listeners connect with you to start their own business conversation? So I have a cheat sheet. It'll tell you everything you need to know on how to host a great disaster party. They just need to email me, K-A-Z, Kaz, at, and I'm going to spell it out, I-A-M-D-R-K-A-Z.com, I-M-Dr-Kaz.com. And that's the address where I'd just go and have a look because there's a little introductory video there and that will give you a bit more clue into how Dr. Kaz works. And As I mentioned earlier, we've not even touched the surface of what Dr. Kaz knows about how to disaster-proof your business. And you can relate that to a business, to a career, which might or might not be in business, and uh, also to sporting activities. So this has been absolutely great, Dr. Kaz. Uh, Wonderful to have you on here. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, my pleasure, Clive. This was fun. Thanks for listening to another episode of Business Conversations with Clive Enever. Make sure you subscribe to future episodes via your favourite podcast app and you can find more business resources at cliveenever.com.au.